Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we've got Dan Humiston. He's the host of MJ Bowles. Dan, thanks for being on the podcast. Josh, thanks for having me. Uh, see, MJ Bowles, I have a whole group of different cannabis podcasts on, on, the, on the network. Okay. Uh, so I started with one show, and then that was Raising Cannabis Capital. And then I added, people said, well, you know, I want to do a show. And, you know, before you knew it, I have seven shows on. And so I, I just, all we do is, it's either, I, do, I host the one show and then we produce a, a, some of the other ones. And then some of people just have us put their show on our network, on our website mm -hmm. and promote it that way. So I'm not really sure exactly what, what it would be now. I mean, it's sort of morphed into you know, a combination of hosting a show and hosting other people's shows and producing other people's shows. So that's, I mean, that's kind of the big picture of what MJ Bulls has morphed into. I'll tell you, when I started, it had, I had no, uh, my only plan was to just to do a podcast to keep busy. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's morphed into a lot more than that. Yeah, it's probably going to continue to, to pivot, I would imagine. Uh, as, as people stay home and there's maybe more time or more efficiencies, more availability, um, I would imagine that your podcast is probably going to continue to, to drift uh, away from what you intended it to be, just kind of to fit the, the current need. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I think the, I don't know, I think this is so new that to try to, try to pick where we're going to be or anticipate where it's going to be to, is, is I, I think it's just really a, a guessing game at this point. Do people listen to more podcasts because they have more time? Do they listen to less podcasts because they're stressed out about everything and they don't, you know, they don't want, they, they don't have any time to concentrate. I don't know. Uh, and you're, you're right. The, the uh, I mean, the scope of, of our shows each of our shows, our, our, the scope is pretty narrowly defined, which I think will be helpful unless, for instance, the Raising Cannabis, Cannabis Capital podcast. That one, I mean, a lot of companies right now, I suspect, have put their Raising Cannabis or their Raising Capital plans on hold. So, and a lot of investors are just holding tight with, with their portfolio and not with, with not a lot of interest of adding any. So it puts that show kind of in a holding pattern, I guess to, you know, you'd say, because, so we may have to make some adjustments to that show, at least in the short term. But the other shows, I, you know, I think like they're all, you know, they all have a, a lot of content for, I don't know, for their audience. Yeah. I think for, for interviews and, and culture and, um, you know, things of that nature, it's going to be easier. I think there's going to be more people that are accustomed to Zoom uh, or Microsoft Teams or, or these, uh, you know, technologies to be able to interact with folks. But then I would also think that even, even the capital raises, they're going to be more difficult. You, I just saw Tilray um, got a, a a significant amount. I don't know if it was 90 million or 30 million, but it was a lot of money. They had to go out in the secondary market and give preferable rates uh, to an institutional investor. So this is still, you know, a bank or brick and mortar looking for, for capital, but not through the traditional ways of, of the public markets that they're already a part of. They needed mm -hmm. an, an extra, uh, you know, some, some sweetness to that deal. So I yeah. would imagine that there are going to be some companies that would like the exposure um, on platforms like this to, to just get the word out either from mom and pops or from uh, trying to, to become more vertically integrated for a buyout M and a, I think there's gonna be a lot of M and A's, but I think people that are even on, on trying to, to get capital uh, as value starts to become more transparent. We're starting to see, valuations come down and that value investor is starting to come out of the closet off of the sidelines, potentially looking to invest as the capital markets have been so depressed. Maybe there's an opportunity and we've already starting to see today, um, you know, that, that separation or the disconnect from everything taking a dive to maybe cannabis companies being a part of sin stocks or vice stocks 
that have an inverse relationship to the overall market as soon as margin calls have been met, as soon as everything collapses, maybe cannabis will start to see that pop like we're seeing today, even with the, the Dow and S&P down 3.5%, some of those cannabis companies are, are going up. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I said this, well, we've had a number of um, shows where we, where, this, where we touched on this topic at some point in the show. And my opinion has always been that the industry, the buyers, the users, the market share, the market size, I should say, isn't getting smaller. And so people refer to it as a can of session. And I, and I, and I kind of disagree with that because the industry, the users are growing. The opportunities, uh, different states are expanding. So the the, I guess the, the opportunities have increased. I think what you saw was a, a, a convergence of a bunch of different factors all hit at once. And it, it caused a bunch, it caused the numbers and the valuations to drop. Not the least of which was the stock market was doing great. And if people were like, geez, do I put my money into cannabis, a cannabis stock or but invest into a private company, or do I put it in the market? A lot of people were just saying, why don't you stay in the market right now? It's doing great. And so I think that, I mean, as simple as that had an impact. And then once the selling started, there were no in institutional investors to backstop it. So it really looked a lot worse than it probably was. And I think that flowed from the public market into the private markets and the private companies all their valuations took a hit too because people, you know, got nervous. I think, I don't know if their valuations are where they belong right now. Maybe they're, you know, maybe they might inch their way back up to, but I don't see, I don't think they'll ever get back to where they were. I think that was a little bit of hype of, of, of fueled by maybe a little bit of emotion. But right now, I think that this is a good time if, especially for, you know, some of these states like California deem dispensaries as essential businesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, who, who would have thought? <laughs> who would have thought that? So they're going to need, they're going to need supply. They're going to need cultivation. They're going to need inventory. And if California does it, I suspect other states will feel the same. I had an I don't want to dominate this, but I, I, I don't want to lose this thought before I pass it back to you. One of our other shows, the Deadhead Cannabis Show, the host of that show is from Chicago. And as you know, Illinois just in December or in January rolled out their rec program and the governor passed a rule that people can order online and the dispensaries can walk it out to their car curbside pickup of pot. I mean, that used to be illegal. <laughs> you pull it up to the curb and get your, get your drugs on the side of the road. And in, I mean, just imagine how much things have changed in the, you know, just in a couple of years where now you can order your, your, your cannabis online, pull up, not even get out of your car and somebody walks out to your car and hands it to you. That is, so I, I think that you might be right. This is, this might be one of those times where, the bad news turns into good news for for us. Un, unintended consequences could be the industries, some of the industry businesses valuations just go up because of this. Who knows? Yeah. In addition to California, I think New Jersey and some other uh, states have also um, declared cannabis to be uh, essential. So those essential businesses for both medicinal and otherwise are, they're staying open, which I think is good here in, in Seattle. There's six foot lines, you know, written in chalk of where you can stand pre-orders <laughs> only. So everyone has already pre-ordered. You haven't paid yet. Um, and so you, you have to go in and pay and then, and then they have it in a bag and you're ready to go. Um, but yeah. I, you know, I think looking earlier at some of the activity on the market, you saw gold, you saw everything plummeting as those margin calls were met. And I think as kind of that uh, starts to subside and go away, you are going to see some of these companies start to take off. Um, 
I mean, you can't really get much lower than, than what Tilray and some of these other companies have gone through at 94%. Um, so if you are a gambler, since some of the casinos in Vegas are closed, it might present a pretty good opportunity <laughs> to throw something at it. You could do dollar cost averaging if it goes down. Um, but it's not a bad gamble, I, I think, right now. If some of them aren't profitable yet, um, nonetheless, I think there's some decent opportunities. I don't know. I, I still look I, at I just, it as a, as a portfolio as a whole. The industry is solid, and I think there will be that inverse relationship for SIN stocks. Individually, a lot of those individual equities are going to fail. Whether they can go bankrupt or not, depending on where they're at, a lot of them won't be around, which will lead to a fourth quarter pop. Those that do remain in business will see a huge sales spike as you know some of the bigger players are gone, uh, or, and a lot of the smaller players uh, you know, are just either they give up uh, from capitulation, they merge, um, or they or they just walk away. A lot of them are altruistic that haven't paid themselves in a long time and haven't been able to. And this is uh, kind of the shit that hit the fan, really. If it wasn't, you know, a forced pandemic, uh, a recession by proclamation, on top of uh, an already inflated bubble, Canada saw speculation like crazy. People were throwing money at it just because they like cannabis. You know, yeah. just like Tesla, people like an EV model, even though Tesla, in my opinion, is a terrible investment. I love the EV model, but that I made a bet that at 900 bucks, we were going to see it hit 200 and it's hovering around 420 right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so Jim McAlpine and out, down in California is going to owe me an ounce of weed uh, when it hits $200. <laughs> uh, not because I don't like the model, but just I just don't think the valuation is, is where it should be. So there's going to be some value folks out there looking to kind of scoop it up. We're already seeing distressed assets and vultures flying over the place looking for that next thing. So rather than starting your own business and learning from, from the troubles, you can just step in buy a company with licenses, property, plant, and equipment for pennies on the dollar and take it from there. Yeah. And I think that's going to be, I think the opportunity is for people that are, that have cash. And because it's, if, if, uh, if cash was king before it's, it's, uh, <laughs> now it's the, the ruler because everything is going to be so price, price discounted that if you have cash right now, or if you can assemble or pull together some cash, there's going to be some real good buying opportunities, especially like you said, if you wanted to pick up some licenses that otherwise were just astronomically expensive, people that can't afford to stay in business, you know, maybe, maybe at some point are willing to sell it for a re more reasonable price. Yeah, it's an opportunity, I think, too, for, for some of the, the individual businesses that, you know, they maybe thought that they were going to have a legacy. They thought that they were going to be able to compete, you know, against 7-Elevens and be that Larry's Handy Mart, whereas now they're like, I don't want to be Larry's Handy Mart in a sea of 7-Elevens. I, I, I want to look for a better strategic partner. You know, Tilray's out there floundering without a corporate partner, and I guarantee you they wish they had one before this debacle happened. But the opportunities for individual businesses, whether it's a producer, processor, or retailer, that opportunity that now as it presents itself could create a, a, a bigger player than before, whereas they just weren't ready to hear that. Their, their ego or whatever else was in the way, whereas now they're maybe reassessing that opportunity to become a conglomerate or a, a bellwether, economic cannabis bellwether, where they're, they're big from seed to sale. Uh, in mm -hmm. multiple states, uh, it just kind of maybe were, was going to take this this cataclysm for uh, for them to reevaluate, you know, how to to be a going concern, how to be a household name, uh, and maybe this is that opportunity. Oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I I've I've spoken to so many people. Recently, we're doing a, a series right now on dispensary chains and. Over the years, over the last couple of years, I've spoken to a lot of dispensary owners with you know, one or two locations with ambitions to be a national chain. And it, 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 it's just overwhelming how much would be involved in taking a, a two-store chain to become a national chain. I mean, it, it, the, the complexities are just beyond comprehension. And, but the confidence and the bravado of the people that I've that I would talk to, 
were, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, they needed to be dialed back. And I think the only, I think a situation like this would take somebody that had a plan to be a national chain and say, man, I would just like to make a living. I just like to be able to pay my bills. And that's, I mean, that changes quickly when you are worried about groceries and you're worried about paying your mortgage, your plans and your, I don't want to say optimism, but your, your sense of in, 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 um, of invulnerability or invincibility that changes quickly. And I think that's, and I think that's, I actually think it's necessary. It may have maybe happening quicker than we anticipated because of, of, of what's happened, but I think it's necessary and that's going to make, I mean, it's going to make it more realistic for mergers to occur and for roll-ups to occur because you can't, you can't have that situation when you have a whole group of people that feel like they can do it on their own. Uh, even as, as, um, as untenable as that may be, uh, there were a lot of people that thought that they could do it on their own. And I just, I think now is the time that you might see that, like you said, mergers and some and a possible nice roll up to get to a critical, a critical mass where you could say, you know, we have, we have three or 400 locations in a few different States. And now we want to th- jump to the next level versus we have, eight locations and we want to jump to the next level. I, I, there's so much infrastructure involved in going from eight locations to 200 locations to 100 locations that, that, um, you know, all that stuff has to take place before you can reasonably think that you're going to get, be the next Starbucks. Yeah, there's a lot of issues that go with that. You're looking at med men, um, you know, commercial real estate is going down. So what's that going to do to their bottom line, to their valuation? Um, you, you know, there's, uh, there's other issues too. Um, you know, there's this article from MJ Business Daily where Have a Heart is a Seattle-based retailer. They have five or six locations here. Then they went out and grabbed, you know, a dozen or so licenses. Um, and they, they got a friends and family round at 25 million. And then they went out and got another 75 million from a, a series A oversubscribed by 75 million. So total, they had 150 million. They went out, uh, they did their thing. And then I, you know, we're reading here that Harvest Health confirms a, an $85.8 million deal uh, with, with Have a Heart. So I'm not sure if, if they spent all the money or if they lost <laughs> lost basically a, a ton of money, 60, $70 million. Um, we've already seen sale leaseback options where people had property or plant equipment, had to sell it and then immediately lease that back so that they could get some money. Mm-hmm. So people are looking, it looks like an early liquidation. Uh, this deal was in, initially uh, announced in January and it finally went through because Harvest Health had to cancel some other stuff that they were doing. So I think we're already starting to see some value uh, transactions instead of the speculation that we saw in Canada, which makes the U S probably look really, really good by comparison to some folks that want to get in, um, you know, to the market now at the quote bottom uh, as it's dropped and lost so much money already. Well, back to, I mean, yeah, I'm just, it's crazy that they were able to close that round even, you know, even, but I'm, you know, I stay on with it with the dispensary as the retail side of this business, and yet one of the advantages of a chain is versus I'm going to refer to it as mom and pop is that the chains can leverage their infrastructure and gain some huge economies of scale. But in cannabis, that's not always the that's not always an advantage because unless you know, unless within that state so the multi-state operators don't have the huge advantage that a multi-state operator in another industry would have because you have to a lot of the infrastructure has to be rebuilt in each in each of the states and so it's it's just like i said like i've said this before you just you can't just roll in people from or i don't think it's going to be as easy to roll executives in from other retail multi-state or national chains into cannabis 
because a lot of their experience is built around being able to just flow from across state lines. And a lot of the advantages, like I said, with a national chain is the emphasis is, is leveraging the economies of scale, which some of them you can't, some of the advantages in cannabis, cannabis you can't leverage. So I, I don't know that you can use the same models to forecast a roll up or growth that you could with that, that currently exist. You almost have to build a new one. Yeah. I've, I've been pretty critical of Brandon Kennedy of Tilray and his lack of uh, experience with cannabis. He just thinks it's a commodity and then he can step in and, and treat the company like any other uh, consumer product good. And I think that's probably going to show um, through his expulsion, he's going to be probably fired or forced to step down. Um, and their stock price has already taken a hit along with everybody else. But I think that um, you need to have an understanding of cannabis, the culture or the commodity or, um, or everything, <laughs> because if you don't, it's, it's just a different beast. It's not normalized. It's not an ingredient yet. No, and, you, and it's, whether it's, whether it's at the cultivation end, which is, it's, it's different than, a, than other, it's different than growing tomatoes. I, I, there's, it's just way more complex or it's the retail side, which it's different than serving up a, a, a latte. There's a lot more involved and a lot, just throwing a lot of money at it isn't the answer. You know, and, and, and bringing people in from other, other industries, executives that have had success in other industries, that isn't the answer either. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole different model. And in, in when people start appreciating that and, and applying that, I think that's when you're going to see the, the groups that are going to that, that do that are going to, are going to re jump out ahead of the pack. So what's your crystal ball say about uh, legalization? I've said on this podcast before that it's going to take a calamity, a, an economic crisis for conservatives to be able to pitch to their constituents that they need to legalize cannabis for the revenue. Uh, now that we're there, do, what's your crystal ball say about uh, legalization? As we, I think we have 33 states plus DC. Uh, is this going to speed things up? I, I don't think that you're going to ever get conservatives to make that argument that, that um, you have to do it for revenue. I, 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 I don't think that's the argument just because I, I just, you know, I, I think that that runs counter to, to, to their whole foundation of beliefs. I think that the, I think the message if you wanted to get conservatives would be, I think you have to look at the medical the, the medical side of it and get your foot in the door on the medical side. And so the states that have not passed medical programs, I, I think I think that's the key right now, at least in the short term, is to get you know if you could get the entire country on a you know in a medical program, I think then the transition to to adult use would be much more much more likely. Uh, but I think that. I, I, I think you, I don't think you can skip that step. And I, and I, and I, as much as I wish that it would happen, I think, I think that I, I just don't, I don't see them. I mean, gee whiz, they just came up with, or they're coming up with $2 trillion bailout. Like it's going to be a tough argument to say, oh yeah, we need 50, 50 or a hundred million dollars in cannabis revenue. <laughs> I just think that's going to be a tough argument. I, I, I think it's a, I think it's I think it's a sound argument, but I think from a I think conservatives will reject that argument. So that's why I think if you know if I were gonna if I were gonna lobby a conservative member of Congress or this, I would I would I would lead with the medical side. I would meet, I would lead with with that would be my lead. And I also I think to strengthen that lead, I think we need if we can get the more reliable or um, supportable research that that can that can that can that'll give that'll give these members of Congress 
the cover they need to bring it back to their constituents. I think that's going to be really one of the keys. So that would be just, you know, short term. That's my opinion on that. Yeah, I think on the on the surface, they'll say this is about the kids. This is about medical. But behind the scenes, it's going to say, OK, we're well, all our state in Kentucky or Louisiana, wherever is going to generate X amount of revenue. Uh, just for my own bias, everything on this podcast is looked through the lens of finance. And uh, it's my opinion that it's going to be the, the tax revenues that legalize it, not not the medical part, but I do see your point of, of leading with uh, medical and the benefits and how it's going to save and help the children and whatever, you know, the feel good message is the real reason I think is going to be the tax revenue. Um, oh, yeah. And states like Illinois are, their pension plans are, are uh, screwed to, to put it nicely. <laughs> well, they, yeah. I mean, that Illinois, New York, some of the states, um, they got them, been a lot, a lot of years that got us to this point. I, I'm, again, just to qualify, that the um, I would say that would be the position I would take if I were talking to a conservative member of, of, of Congress, or if I were a conservative member of Congress and I was trying to sell this to my constituents, that would be what I'd lead with. But just because I don't think leading with dollars is, is, is the right approach for that, for that um, sector. Um, but I also, but I also think, and I, I also think, uh, jobs are, are, are another, would be my, my next go-to. I would go to jobs second on that one. The, um, you know, I, back when I first got involved with the industry, I started a trade show in 2014 and I, I remember a lot of the people that were at the events or they were exhibiting at the events or speaking at the events had a lifetime or nearly a lifetime of, of involvement with the industry. And they were reluctant to have uh, what I would refer to as carpet baggers, people that weren't involved in the industry come in. And my argument had been, has always been that until businesses embrace this, the industry will never get, it will never get to the next level. And now that industry and in our businesses have been, are, are involved and investments involved, I mean, all of that stuff is necessary to get this to where we are right now. And, and I think the, you know, the final step is, is, is legislation and talk about a, a glacier moving process. It's not going to happen quickly. And especially when other things like the, this pandemic, I mean, it's, it's just sucks it by good reason sucks the, all the air out of the, out of the room. There's no, we're not going to have this conversation. There's going to be nothing going on until, until we get some, we stop the bleeding on this, no pun intended on this, on this uh, crisis that we're in right now. Right. Yeah. I was writing a bill for uh, consumption lounges. It's a felony in Washington state to maintain and operate a marijuana lounge. So I was writing a bill to overturn that and implement, you know, laws for, uh, a cannabis cafe, but there, <laughs> you can't congregate over 10 people in Seattle anyway. So there's absolutely no tolerance, no time uh, to even submit that bill. So yeah, everything is going to be taken uh, a seat uh, uh, for this, this pandemic to, to play out. Yeah. But, and, and, and it should, it, mm. there's no question it should. I think now is the time for everybody to get, get, be prepared for when it's, when it, starts to level off and we get and we and we get some clarity on the situation be ready you know that's and that's and that because there will be opportunities when that happens and you know at that point bills like you like you're proposing they'll need stuff to do <laughs> to do like that and that's going to be yeah yeah it's uh politics and cannabis oh man that's a <laughs> crazy topics awesome well before we wrap this up how can people get a hold of you dan what's uh, with some uh email or social media links people can come and check you out well for first off go to our website it's mjbulls.com we have seven cannabis podcasts all targeting different genres within the cannabis industry so that would be a good way to start uh you can always if you have questions for me personally, it's at D Humiston, H-U-M-I-S-T-O-N at M-J-Bulls.com. 
And you can find us on uh, all the social media um, platforms. Instagram is MJ Bulls One, and MJ Bulls Podcast is Facebook and Twitter. So yeah, we're we're on every we're we're everywhere, and we have about every week we have five or six new podcasts a week of different from from all of our different shows. So check us out at MJBulls.com. And we'll put all those uh, links in the show notes as well. With that, I want to thank my guest, Dan Hummingson. He's a, a host at MJ Bowls. Thanks again, Dan. Oh, you're welcome, Josh. Thanks for having me. And keep up what you're, keep up the good work. We, we need, we need good podcasts during this shut-in period. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out.